Good evening and welcome to today's webinar presented by the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Before we begin tonight's discussion, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work and study and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us tonight. The topic that our panel will be discussing is animal welfare in the 21st century. Are we meeting their needs? Now, my name is Professor Andrew Fisher. I'm Chair of Cattle and Sheep Production Medicine at the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, and I'm also Director of the Animal Welfare Science Centre. I'm joined today by Dr. Alison Clark, who is a graduate of the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program at the University and holds the position of Animal Welfare Specialist working with Zoos Victoria. Alison is a veterinarian with a background in zoo and wildlife medicine, who currently coordinates animal welfare research with Zoos Victoria and supports the continual development of animal welfare policy, strategy and procedures. Dr. Lauren Hemsworth is a Senior Research Fellow in Animal Welfare from the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. Lauren's research focuses on a range of animal welfare subjects, including the human-animal relationship, animal housing and husbandry practices, animal welfare assessment methodology, and community attitudes towards animal welfare across farm, companion, and zoo settings. Dr. Peter Hitchens is a Senior Research Fellow in Equine Veterinary Epidemiology in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. Peter has extensive epidemiological expertise and racing industry experience, and her research involves using evidence-based findings to inform changes to policy and practice that improve the health, safety and welfare of both racehorses and the jockeys who ride them. And then finally, I'm joined by Dr. Mia Cobb, who is a research fellow at the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. Mia researches the welfare of animals and is currently interested in how the intersections of animal welfare science, human psychology, science communication and emerging technologies can help animals and people lead happier lives. So thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I want to let everyone know that there will be a time at the end of this event to take some of your questions so please uh, feel free to submit questions uh, using the Q&A function. All right, so to, to start off, I think, um, we're probably having this webinar because societal expectations of how we treat and engage with animals has changed and is continuing to change. I suppose to start off and perhaps to start with you, Lauren, in relation to farm animals, how have these changing societal attitudes manifest in terms of you know, expectations around animal welfare for farm animals? Mm, I think, as you mentioned, we're seeing a greater awareness within uh, the general public and society around animal welfare. And there's increasing concern around not just um, avoiding negative experiences, but also allowing animals to have those positive experiences. And in fact, we actually see that societal concern and expectations are what drive our standards and guidelines and legislation. Within farm animals um, or the livestock industries, we tend to see that community concerns are the primary driver when we're looking at animal welfare change, one of the primary drivers. And that tends to come about through two main um, factors. So we perhaps think a little bit about purchasing behaviour or um, consumatory behaviour, and we also think a little bit about community behaviours. And traditionally, purchasing behaviour hasn't been predicted by attitudes towards animal welfare and animal use. It's been other factors like price, uh, health concerns, environment. But we're starting to see a bit of a shift where we're seeing attitudes towards animal use and particularly attitudes towards animal welfare become a more important predictor around purchasing behaviour. So that's obviously one of the um, key factors there. We also have community behaviours and they're 
the behaviours that you see members of the community performing generally when they're concerned around animal welfare within farm, um, the farm animal industries but also other animal use industries. And we tend to see community behaviours be things like um, attending protests, writing uh, letters to newspapers, uh, to politicians, perhaps social media type posts, so those types of community um, behaviours. We're also probably seeing quite a good example of it um, recently around the review for the poultry standards and guidelines. And we saw unprecedented um, public input, which saw the, the process go through a number of different, different reviews. So we tend to see those two key behaviours from, from the public. And really, um, our societal expectations drive um, standards and guidelines, legislation, so uh, industry productivity, as well as sustainability. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Perhaps moving to zoos, Alison, how have you know, changing societal expectations around animal welfare uh, influenced you know, what's, what happens in zoos around animal welfare? Thanks, Andrew. Look, I think people generally are tuning in a lot more um, to animals and the experiences that animals can have. Um, I think people are much more aware of the depth of experience um, that, that animals are able to have. And for that reason, I think they really do expect that anyone who's responsible for animals, um, whether that be in animal care or animal use, are creating um, situations and environments where um, where those animals really can have a real rich experience, but not just for uh, not just for today, but for tomorrow and for the future and for their whole of life. Um, and so I think that's something that we, um, I think the community knows that we have got incredible expertise and that we are very good at looking after the animals under our care. Um, but I think that there's increasing um, emphasis on us needing to share that information and explain. And look, people are really intrigued. Obviously, people want to know um, what happens um, sort of behind the scenes at, at zoos and they want to know about zookeepers. They want to know about all of that incredible wealth of knowledge that we hold. Um, so I think one thing is really just that communication about what we do and then also raising the bar and just continuing to, to do better for all the animals that are under our care. Um, another thing I think to reflect on though is that um, over time I think people are starting to ask more questions about uh, if, we are, if we do have animals in captivity um, or, and we are breeding them, that it's not just enough to, to do those activities. We really need to explain and articulate why we're doing why, why, would, why we do what we do. Um, and um, I think, again, that comes back to us um, really articulating the, articulating the tangible benefits that, that, and the good work uh, that, that zoos across the world are engaged with. And I was thinking about this and I remember a time um, and I can't, I, I can't imagine this would happen very, very often, but there was a time when I was um, standing uh, next to a um, a donation point within the zoo and I had a I had a, um, a community member or a visitor um, and I was in uniform and they came up and they just um, they, they actually yelled at me and I was taken aback and they basically explained to me that they were they were annoyed that we had this you know how there was no chance that the money in this that was going into this donation point there was no chance that that money was helping that species and I was I mean I was blown away and I just think it's just important for us to explain that absolutely like so much of what we do is has real world benefits um, and people I think are in, enthralled when they start to understand that it's not just that you know zoos uh, may provide money to um, to various different conservation activities um, it's also people our our expertise our people within the zoo are actually going out and working directly and so I think it um, I think it's really important for zoos to really explain and look for more opportunities to create those direct benefits, those really tangible benefits um, for animals um, beyond the zoo as well as inside the zoo. Thank you. And I guess it shows that sometimes these societal expectations can have a, a pointy end to them. And Peter, you work obviously with racehorses. And I guess the issue of you know, animals in use in sport and entertainment has obviously you know, intersected at times with uh, changing societal expectations around animal welfare. 
I mean, how how is that manifest in relation, for example, in, in the racing sector? I think, and, I mean, the the biggest example I can give really because it's on being the public perception on a global stage has been, you know, the seven fatalities on Melbourne Cup Day over the last decade. And uh, the racing industry has really had a lot of scrutiny um, uh, on onto, you know, it's um, the perception of, of racing because of these fatalities. And it's... Uh, manifested as increased activism. For example, Not to the Cup campaign has become quite popular now. Um, uh, some of the activist organisations um, tend to almost keep better records occasionally than parts of the racing industry themselves, or at least there there is more transparency there. And I would really say that one of the, the key points to um, trying to ensure that um, any industry, not just the racing industry or any industries that, that um, uh, utilise animals for sports or entertainment um, are as transparent as they possibly can, um, not just about what's happening within their industry but how they're addressing those concerns that are coming up and that they're proactive about addressing those. And if they're proactive rather than reactive and what we've seen in the past, um, you know, particularly in the racing industry, has been reactivity. Reactivity, for example, to the ABC um, report on the retirement of racehorses, um, reactivity to the fatalities that have occurred on Melbourne Cup Day. Um, but the industry is getting ahead of those because the uh, is really important. They're doing some very, very important work. They really are um, working to, to ensure that the animals um, within those sports are being cared for to the best of their ability. And those standards are obviously changing over time and they are, you know, the, the bar is now getting higher and higher. Um, and it's up to um, us as researchers um, and the industry to try and meet that bar. I guess it's a good example, isn't it, with the racing sector where the societal expectation, in some cases concern, obviously, is not just focused on the point of racing in that time point, but actually the animal's whole of life experience, isn't it? And, the, and the, what happens to the animal afterwards. A hundred percent. And that's, that's become, really, that's quite a, a recent thing, actually, the, the whole of life experience for um, racehorses. I think because we've only ever seen, um, you know, the Melbourne Cup being screened on TV, so the, the general public... I guess maybe didn't think about what happens before the horses get to the track during breeding and after the horses finish. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, the more the social media has increased, I think, um, the more awareness there is about um, animals being used in these industries, um, the, the more the public perception, not just around what happens on race day, but um, getting to race day and post race day as well. Yeah. It's certainly important. Thank you. And, and Mia, I know you work a lot with companion animals as part of your portfolio, especially dogs. And I guess it might be slightly different, but I guess the, in terms of societal expectations and, and how we view our companion animals, such as dogs, that's probably changed as well, hasn't it? Well, it's interesting because listening to Peter talk about horse racing, obviously there's some parallels with the greyhound racing industry um, and consideration for whole of life and welfare and what happens, I guess, when the community becomes aware, when practices aren't aligning with their expectations. So when we have media exposés, whether it's in livestock, whether it's in racing, um, and we see that response of the community and, and the fact that it can interrupt entire industries, grind them to a halt, um, it shows the power of that, I guess, community attitudes towards the way that we interact with and, and use animals. Um, and whether that is for racing greyhounds, whether that is in relation to thinking about guide dogs or police dogs or detection dogs or security dogs and how are all of those puppies bred and reared and housed and managed throughout the course of their life? What does their retirement look like? And maybe people haven't necessarily thought about those things, even though they're aware of dogs in those roles. Um, yeah, I think that's something the accountability that Peter talks about is something that those industries that rely on those animals really need to bring to the forefront um, of their minds now because being transparent and proactive in assuring the public that those animals have got their welfare assured, not just that we're reducing 
um, cruelty or harms, like Lauren pointed out, but that we're assuring them positive experiences. And through our research, we know these are, you know, highly social, intelligent animals that have meaningful lives that we need to fulfill. And so we need to make sure that throughout their life, we're providing um, that good quality of welfare. When it comes to the animals that are living in our homes, perhaps we might have rose tinted glasses a little bit in terms of, um, I don't know, I guess we, we assume we know the animals that are in our homes, even though our experience with them may be limited to just one or two or three or five animals. Um, not necessarily the wealth of experience that a zoo has caring for hundreds of species and lots of different individuals. And animals are individuals, so they will have differences and quirks and needs that will vary. Um, we can't just treat every horse the same because one might love going out to the field with friends and one may hate that. So we have to account for animals as individuals. Um, I think with companion animals, one of the things is that that scrutiny that is being applied to um, industries is harder when animals are living in private situations. It's much harder to police levels of care and um, apply perhaps the standards of welfare that um, our governments expect. Um, so it's a bit trickier in that regard. And I guess there's some areas of concern that we have where actually from a scientific perspective, we understand quite well that some you know, dogs, um, perhaps those with the really flat faces, those breeds are living lives where they're struggling. And it's um, really hard because we know that they're beautiful dogs. We know that their owners really care for them, but we've got this real problem um, that we need to address. And without fully understanding people's attitudes and the, the kind of social psychology aspects of their relationships with their dogs, it's hard for us as scientists to tap into what will change that behavior to encourage people to move away from that body type that we know just isn't great for companion dogs. So perhaps we might sort of turn the discussion around a bit and you raise the example of brachycephalic dogs and perhaps there's other examples where, you know, the way we, we, we have our dogs and our interaction with them has changed probably over the last 20 or 30 years, certainly from when I was young, the, the role of the dog and how we view the dog, but also how much time apart from the last two years when we've all been working at home, how much time people have been able to spend with their dog um, given you know, our changing lifestyles. So perhaps the question I'll come back to you, Mia, then is, um, you know, turning it around, I mean, we talk about how societal expectations in modern society have changed, but actually what about the dogs themselves? I mean, are we meeting their welfare needs? Yeah, the, uh, look, it's a great question and one I think we all need to probably ask ourselves. Um, I think there's certainly this dynamic with animals that is shifted. And that's what, when we talk about changing community attitudes, that's that's what we're seeing is this, you know, mirroring other areas of our lives as well, where perhaps our relationship has been more about ownership, exploitation. Now we're seeing this recognition for them as sentient animals and what do we need to do to meet their needs. And if we're leaving a highly social animal alone for 12 hours a day while we go out to work because we like it when they wag their tail and make a big fuss of us when we come home, that's really holding up a mirror to us and our needs rather than perhaps focusing on what the dogs need or the cats or the rabbits, whatever it may be. Um, and I think that that's a difficult thing a community needs to, I guess, assess and consider. Um, it's really important that we have animals in our lives and we know that the animals in our homes help connect us to the animals in nature and then we know that that is really good for our well-being. But what I think is perhaps not so considered and from a research perspective as well is understanding and centering animal needs and that's what we're seeing i guess this shift towards how can we better do that so yeah and perhaps then let's focus in on what we see as some of the animal welfare challenges and issues in the different sectors we're familiar with and and you know what are these welfare issues and how do we start to address them so i might um come back to to you allison in relation to you know animals in zoos or as part of the you know, the zoos um, sector. Um, what, what are some of the welfare issues that you're sort of looking at and aiming to improve and, and how you, as a sector, are aiming to go about that? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Look, I just want to actually come back to the, the, the point about um, brachycephalic uh, dogs. And, and we're talking about needs and providing for the needs of animals here. And um, obviously, I'll come to, to speak about our zoo, zoo species in, the, in a moment. But it's just so fascinating to me because obviously when we're talking about brachycephalic in, in particular, it's um, it's such a, and the need is, we, they all animals have a need to breathe. We all have that need. 
And unfortunately, we've gotten to a scenario where we've bred, bred in these, these animals that, um, that every day is, is a struggle for them, that individual animal to, to meet that need. And I think it's, it's one of the most important things we have to reflect on. And then as someone who um, thinks a lot in evolutionary terms, um, if we, um, you know, if we thought about it and if when we're talking about uh, individual animals that we know that, you know, dogs want to run around and they want to have fun, um, that's, that's what they do. And um, evolution never would have created um, a flat-faced animal um, that, that needs to run around and to, to breathe um, as, as intensely as obviously a, a dog that's running around and exercising um, has to. So, you know, there, there, is a, there is a point where reflecting on evolution can be quite helpful and just recognising um, recognizing that, 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 that issue that we have there. And, and obviously we can all work together to, to change that. And I think that's what, you know, people like um, researchers like Mia, your work, you know, to, to try to make people think about, um, think about their, their pet dogs and what can be done. Um, and then coming to zoo species, I think um, we've got, you know, we've got similar similar questions because in that scenario, the animals themselves haven't changed, but of, of course we've um, put, uh, we've, we've created environments that, um, that have got elements that are partially artificial in some way. Um, and uh, there are clear ones that anyone could imagine, which is um, that they don't have as much space as that they as they would have in the wild. Um, but there's lots of subtle things as well, maybe um, certain um, climatic experiences that they would have um, in nature might be different when when they're um, when they're in a zoo. Um, but it really does come back to that expertise. Um, we put a lot of time into um, in, into resourcing. Uh, people and looking for ways and and we do um, engage uh, we collaborate a lot to try to um, learn more really um, collaborate we've got lots of uh, external partners uh, um, academic partners um, and um, and government and 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 just to try to learn more and the more we learn about these species the more we can we can do better are there certain species that just shouldn't be kept in zoos yeah, so this question gets asked a lot, and I think it's um, it's a really important question to ask. Um, but I think it 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 is an oversimplification because it's not just about the species; it's about that whole situation of 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 maybe we have to ask the question more of should this species be held um, in this specific captive environment in this location. Or we need to unpack it a little bit further and think about um, if we do think that there are, there is a particular species that's um, not well adapted to living in captivity. What are those features about those animals that mean that they're, they're not doing well? And how do we provide for those animals better? And um, so I think we can be a little bit more clever about how we think about that. Um, but there is examples and there are examples and um uh, I think people have also, we need to remember that um, most people um, can actually remember the evolution of zoos. Um, you know, I have people. I can, but I was you young, know, it was pe different. People, exactly. And and that evolution is ongoing. So we're always reflecting upon thinking about um, thinking about what, what species um, uh, should be in zoos in different regions of the world and then what we do to look after them for the duration of their lives. Um, but, yeah, there's some contemporary examples um, where uh, much of the zoo profession is reflected upon keeping large, um, large marine mammals, um, for instance, and people do uh, obviously talk about cetaceans a lot, but there's other examples as well. So, um, for instance, dugongs, um, people would have to, if an if a institution was to think about holding um, a species like that, they, they'd have to do some, some really careful thought um, to make sure that they were able to fully provide for, for that species. So there are some examples, yeah. And is there a need sometimes to balance, you know, having an animal for conservation purposes or, you know, a captive breeding program or something like that, but you still obviously have to manage the welfare of those individuals? Does that come into play sometimes? Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it's interesting you ask that, um, Andrew, because uh, there is a perception sometimes that there can be trade-offs in those scenarios. Um, and I think I think within some parts of the sector there can be, um, but on the flip side, um, if if an animal is a conservation species, um, it means we have we tend to have so much um, 
we have so much uh, expertise and so much interest in doing everything that we can possible um, for that species. Um, so they they tend to um, move in unison um, or we, we try to make sure that they move in unison so that we can be um, protecting the species but also protecting the welfare of those individual animals. Okay, thank you. And Lauren, obviously you work with farm animals and there's a whole range of species yeah. and production systems there. But perhaps if you want to highlight a, a few examples of where there's some key welfare issues that, that are, are being addressed or need to be addressed and what, what the approaches are to try to you know, improve the welfare of those farm animals. I actually think the, the challenges that we face are, are quite common across, across the different livestock industries as well as the other animal uses. So we're, we're still sort of grappling with questions around the impact or the effect of the way in which we house our farm animals um, on their welfare, the way in which we manage them. So whether it's social groupings, whether we're talking about, you know, intensive versus extensive, confinement versus loose systems, indoor versus outdoor. So those, those questions, thinking a little bit about the, the effect of uh, handling, so human animal interactions is a really important one, the human animal relationship. So we see that. Um, I think as well, we're also sort of expanding on that space around positive experiences and how we measure positive animal welfare and positive experiences and recognising the opportunity and the need for those positive or rewarding experiences. So, um, yeah, quite a lot in that space. So you're, you obviously you do research in this area. Are there a couple of examples where you want to highlight sort of research approaches that you're involved in or aware of that are aimed at addressing some of these, you know, welfare issues for farm animals? Yeah, certainly. So looking at ways of reducing um, the impact. So we recognise that within our farm animals, there's often a number of different husbandry or management practices that are going to be challenging, but are perhaps necessary for health and, and welfare moving forward. So like surgical husbandry practices? Be, yep, we call them um, uh, aversive or painful husbandry procedures. So looking at ways that we can uh, limit or reduce the impact. So for example, um, at the moment, we see a, a significant welfare concern within pigs is tail biting. And it's a multifactorial issue. There's a range of different factors that um, are likely influencing the performance of that behaviour and the way... Where the pigs bite each other's tails. They do. And it's, so it's an abnormal behaviour that has really significant um, productivity and welfare um, implications. And the... The head of management practice for that, not only in Australia but worldwide, has been to uh, tail dock, so remove um, the tail. And so we now have a large project where we're looking at understanding those uh, risk factors or um, the causal factors that bring about tail biting so that we can change management to reduce that risk. We can then remove the need to uh, tail dock and we can rear pigs with tails. So one of the ways that you can potentially reduce those, um, those painful or aversive practices is understanding um, those, the causal factors that are occurring there. We also though recognise that it's not always that easy. So it maybe is looking at ways to build stress resilience so that your animals are a better place to handle those, those different challenges. So some work looking at early experience. So the effect of um, in pigs, uh, maternal contact, maternal interaction, as well as positive human contact and looking at the effect of um, on stress response around some of those, those challenging situations. Um, Thank you. And I guess moving to you, Peter, obviously you talked about the, the fatalities, you know, in major races, which I understand is due to catastrophic, you know, limb fractures and things like that. Yeah. Um, but obviously also the, the whole of life issues. What are some of the approaches that are being taken to try and address, you know, these obvious animal welfare issues that have arisen uh, in, in your sector? Uh, well, particularly because it was so so much in the public eye, there's been significant research programs, especially happening here at University of Melbourne, where we've been um, trying to identify modifiable risk factors that is um, factors that we can change through policy or regulation um, that will 
aim to uh, reduce the injury and fatality rate um, in these racehorses. So we've we've been doing this for um, a number of years, and you know, not just in Australia. Um, I've been doing this in California as well, and a big part of that is because the welfare and safety and health of those racehorses directly affects those, uh, those that work with them, um, particularly the jockeys. So, you know, if, if a racehorse injure, injures itself um, or comes down during the race, that directly affects the jockeys that ride them as well. Um, and the most significant um, injuries and fatalities to jockeys are in fact because they've been riding a horse that has broken down under them. Um, so, you know, the best we can do to protect them is also is also to protect the racehorse. Um, so, you know, the program has really um, uh, identified those things that will make significant changes and we've seen that in, in the last um, couple of years since, uh, since Anthony Van Dyke's death in 2020. Essentially, um, last year fewer international horses came in to the Spring Racing Carnival, um, largely due to the quite stringent mandatory advanced diagnostic imaging um, so we had um, scintigraphy and MRI and standing CT um, of these horses that uh, um, are being nominated and accept to compete in the Spring Racing Carnival. Um, but we've also, our program has also really um, been delving deeply into better or safer training programs for these horses. So we know to build them up so yeah, they're more resilient. Yeah, oh, to an extent. So we know there's probably a sweet spot yeah. there. Too little training means that that horse won't be adapted to the racing conditions and can in fact injure itself because it's not adapted to race. But too much work, too much training, too much workload can also have that effect. So the horse uh, builds up um, a threshold of bone damage, essentially. Um, they're, they're called bone microcracks and they can propagate into a stress fracture. And that's where we see um, basically too little work or too much work can result in those sort of injuries. So what we've been really focusing on is trying to find that sweet spot um, and using advanced diagnostic imaging to help us track um, even longitudinally, you know, through a horse's race, um, racing career, um, where we might be able to early detect these injuries from occurring before they become catastrophic. Okay, thank you. And then I guess, Mia, moving to, to dogs, you, you highlighted some of the ways in which our modern lifestyle may not easily meet the dog's needs, even though they seem very happy when we come home. What are, but more broadly than perhaps that example, what are some of the ways that we can actually work to you know, improve the daily lives and happiness of our animal companions, perhaps? Yeah, what a great question. I think one of the things that differs when we look at dogs compared to these other areas is that they don't have an industry that's funding research and development. So all these other massive multi-million dollar industries um, are really invested in their own sustainability. And so they're putting a lot of money into funding excellent research that will help um, take better care of the animals that they're reliant on. When it comes to uh, dogs, we don't have that. We have some research that's funded to understand how they benefit us, but it tends to be very weighted towards how they help our lives rather than what they need. So um, there's a bit of a deficit there and I guess a lot of uh, important questions we haven't been able to answer from a scientific research perspective yet, I'll put in, hopefully. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess in terms of things people can do at home for their dogs, I guess, you know, recognising that dogs are very different to us. So they're living in a very smelly world. We're very visual primate based animals, um, whereas they're, you know, operating from this ground level. And I'd encourage people to get down, and actually look at their home environment from a dog's perspective. Um, they're really enjoy smells the way we enjoy a beautiful view. So to take your dog for a sniffy walk, let them choose the pace that you go and what they can spend time sniffing, you know, that female tree that they're really interested in is, you know, for them, the equivalent of us looking at a really beautiful view from the top of a mountain. So let them have that moment and enjoy that, um, I guess, sensory experience that is important to them. Giving them social experiences if that's what they like as well, noticing what they like and don't like. And I think you know, a lot of people can probably do a little bit more to read their dog's behaviour because we quite often hear people say, oh, if only my dog could talk to me. And it's like, well, if only you could 
do a little bit more to learn to read its behavior because they are through the way they carry their tail, their ears, their mouth, their whole bodies, um, whether they're loose and waggy and looking all friendly and happy or if they're tense and stiff, um, they are letting us know all the time whether they like or don't like things and we can learn about them as individuals. So I guess they're probably the two things I'd encourage people at home to do is to notice when their dog's opting into an experience and wanting to do it or if it's looking away, licking its lips, choosing to move away, let it go <laughs> um, and give it those sniffy walks. And that's wonderful advice. I, I should take it to heart myself, I think. But <laughs> in terms of research, are there research approaches that we can also perhaps um, employ to improve our dog's lives or understand more about yeah, well, what I mean, makes it's, them happy? It's crazy. Some of the um, earliest, I guess, and some of the best studies as well, looking at animal preferences in terms of what they like have been done with livestock, like chickens. Um, and so it's funny to think that we know more about what chickens want and like in life than we do about, say, dogs. Um, but yeah, I mean, the classic thing is to give animals a choice. And, and what do they choose to do? If we give them the option of going for a walk, um, you know, on lead, or if we give them the option of running around or playing in the backyard with a ball, what would they like to do? And then respecting that choice. So this is a question of agency, animal yeah, agency. Yeah, absolutely. And agency is such a hot topic at the moment. So letting um, animals make their own choices in life. And I think off the back of particularly the lockdowns we experienced here in Melbourne over the last few years, we can all, I think, empathise a little bit more with what it feels like when your choices are restricted. Um, so we, you know, I, I, I'm assuming for us anyway, all employed, we had all the food that we needed, the toilet paper that we needed, we had housing security. We're very lucky through the pandemic. And yet we still felt frustrated and exhausted with that stifling of our social interaction, our capacity to go places. Um, and perhaps that should give us a bit more of a, a lens on what it might be like for our animals when they're left home all day without social interaction or they're not getting choices of places to go or who to interact with. And it's funny because we think about the animals in our homes as having the very best welfare that could ever be possible because we love them so much. But you know, and yes, they are fed and yes, they probably have got great health care. But when we think about agency, are they getting to make a lot of choices compared to, say, a dog living in the wild? You know, let's say a dingo in Australia that has its own choice of environment, its own choice of social interaction, its own choice of sexual behaviours um, that are also meaningful, positive experiences to an animal. So I think we need to then reconsider about what happiness could be for our animals. Wow, that's a, that's a big challenge. So. <laughs> And I guess that brings me perhaps to the, to the last series of questions where we started this conversation thinking about how societal expectations have changed and we, about some of the welfare needs of our animals and how we might aim to meet them. And I guess we don't have a crystal ball, but we probably should think about where we need to get to, where we should aim to get to with our, with our animals and, and meeting their needs, whether it's through agency or just good animal husbandry practices and positive welfare experiences. So in five or 10 years time, in our different areas, where ought our sectors try to get to, do we think? Where should we be? Not in terms of being proactive, I think, as was talked about earlier. So um, we might go any order here who'd like to go first. Where do you think, and you can do it for your own sector or more generally, where do you think we need to get to, you know, five, ten years down the track? I'll go first. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Um, I, I think um, for me personally, what I'd love to see in research, I guess, looking at how dogs help us, is that we're giving just as much attention to the canine experience. So whether that's looking at how can detection dogs be more efficient sniffers or how can um, we better use therapy dogs in courtrooms or educational settings, what I'd like to see is as much attention given to understanding the canine experience in that. So how stressed are they or how much are they loving it? What can we do to um, use that evidence to inform best practice? Um, not just focusing on the human's heart rate or their stress levels or their happiness levels um, so that we're representing both of the parties in that relationship equally. And I think that's something we've got a lot of room for improvement in. Um, so yeah, that's what I personally would like to see. Okay, who'd like to go next? I just need to flag to our helpers here that the um, laptop that will show the audience questions has gone into lock mode. So I might <laughs> need some help on that. Thanks. Um, Peter, you, you'd I like to say something. Go next. Um, I guess what I've been frustrated with is the slow nature of change, um, um, particularly in the racing industry. And jumps racing is a really good example of that 
where in 1997 um, it was discontinued in New South Wales. A full decade later, in 2007, it was discontinued in Tasmania. And um, then again, this year it won't be being conducted in South Australia. Um, so, and Victoria is the only state to, to conduct jumps racing at the moment. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a full, <laughs> um, that's a full nearly three decades of change where, um, where jumps racing has been phased out state by state by state. And that is where um, I've become quite frustrated. There is no national welfare standards for these horses, not even minimum ones. Um, and each state regulates it quite differently. Um, they regulate health, safety and welfare very differently. And I think what we really, and it is coming together, um, you know, we're starting to see it now. We're starting to see committees that are coming together, working on a national level. Um, and that these minimum standards for the care of horses, for the welfare of horses, will come into play soon. Um, but the industries shouldn't be aiming for the minimum. That industry should be aiming for many, many, you know, standards higher above what the minimum is. Um, and as Mia said, you know, that includes bringing into um, to account their mental state. And that's something um, I think that um, in racing and in sports and entertainment for any animals, hasn't really, we've, we've just been trying to meet that minimum. Um, we haven't really gone into, well, um, you know, what do the animals think about that now that they're, you know, they are going to be recognised as sentient. I think there's flagging the forthcoming Victorian legislation oh, is going to yes, include am, yes, animal yeah. sentience as yes, a consideration. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. I think they'll have to assure positive experiences so to be yeah. sustainable because the community won't tolerate, won't accept things that aren't able to do that. Like mm. if we're looking forward another 10 or 20 years, that mm. I feel like the momentum is building so the evolution is becoming more of a revolution yeah. and yeah. there will be more cancelling yes, <laughs> of yeah. things that can't be transparent and assure positive welfare. And I think it should yeah. be a warning, you know, oh, to 100%. all those other mm. industries and ways that we rely on animals that yep. we need to be able to to convince mm. people that we're taking good care of animals or we won't mm. be able to keep having that relationship. Yeah. And Lauren, farm animals, where, where do you think we need to yeah. get to? Well, I think perhaps unsurprisingly, we all tend to have the similar view. And I think when talking about farm animals or other animal uses, it really is that, that need for robust science that allows us to safeguard animal welfare, so abolish those negatives and really um, provide enhancements so those opportunities where animals, regardless of their use or the way in which we are managing them, are having those positive, rewarding experiences. I think the phrase I've seen used is a, that a farm animal, and obviously, you know, some farm animals will in the end go and become meat. Mm -hmm. um, and the phrase I've heard used is, despite that, they ought to have a life worth living and a life that mm -hmm. has an inherent yes. value. Absolutely. Uh, even if you know, in today's society, you know, uh, pe some people eat meat and, and, and choose to do so. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's the idea that if you are safeguarding welfare, you're allowing those opportunities for positive experiences, yeah. then you are going to have positive outcomes when it comes to productivity or animal performance and, mm. and whatnot. So it all goes hand in hand. So. Yeah. And Alison, where, where do you think we need to get to in terms of zoos and animals? Yeah, and I mean, just generally, I think where we need to continue to go is very similar to what Mia was talking about when, when it comes to dogs, is um, providing for good animal welfare or good animal well-being is really about trying to understand what matters to the animals um, and then providing providing those things. And um, Mia was talking about the sensory experiences of, of dogs. Um, and that's a challenge because if they're ex we're in the same world, but if they're experiencing the world differently mm -hmm. to how we are experiencing the world, mm -hmm. there's obviously, a, there's a bit of a, a gap or a jump. We have to sort of get into the minds of, of that animal. And, and that's the, the same um, within the zoo environment at a, at, a, at a big scale. And it's trying to understand all those different experiences and those different worlds of those individual, those different species but also those individual animals we have to remember that individuals are different as well mm. um, and so um, we work very hard on continuing to yeah, build that knowledge base so that we can um, understand um, what matters to these animals and then provide what what matters um, uh, but the other important thing I think to mention too about you know we're talking about um, 
wanting to create change and um, this is more a, a reflection of, across the animal care and animal use industries. If we want to create that change, we really need to be making sure that, you know, that we've got the right, ex the right expertise, that there's resourcing and then there's a strategy for how that change is going to be delivered. Um, and I think really, I mean, one thing that we really need to do in terms of providing the appropriate expertise is that the people that have got that ex expertise, those people are also looked after. I think that's so important. And, um, you know, we've got, we really do have a, um, a mental health crisis when it comes to people who are um, responsible for animals. Um, and um, we see that across the board in, in different parts of, um, of part, parts of the animal industry or the animal care profession and you know we've got a we've got a veterinary crisis um, in particular um, and uh, in in terms of the experiences that, that that veterinarians are having and COVID has obviously intensified so much of that so I really think um, it's animal animal well-being animal welfare and human well-being as well and I, I want to see a lot of one exactly it goes one welfare yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I think that's a good point to, to end on. Um, we'll now try to answer some of the questions uh, that we received from the audience. Uh, if you haven't already, you can use the Q&A function on the webinar to submit a question, and we'll do our best to, uh, to get through some of these. Um, the first question is, um, is animal welfare getting confused with ethics? And, and are the two things separable? Um, who'd like to have first go at that one? <laughs> Everyone's looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really good question and it's one I think we ask ourselves sometimes too. I think when we talk about animal welfare um, from our perspective, I think different people will have different interpretations for both those words. So from a science perspective, when we're talking about animal welfare, we're, we're considering the experience of the animal, its subjective lived experience. Um, and when we're talking about ethics, that's more about what people consider to be right or wrong. So when we come to a concept like good welfare, that's kind of applying an ethical lens to that animal experience. And I think that's where changing community attitudes, so the ethics of people, will change what's acceptable for animal welfare. So I don't think they're getting confused for each other. I definitely think ethics influences what we consider to be okay in terms of how we care for animals. And I think that's shifting over time. So what was considered okay for how we treated a farm dog 50 years ago may not be how we consider it okay to treat it now. Yeah. Um, and the same could be said for, I don't know, an elephant in a zoo or a um, sheep in a... Well, animals in drought. I mean, once yeah, upon exactly. a time in Australia, yeah. if there was yeah. a drought, you know, animals starved. Mm. And now yeah. that's obviously by both the farming sector and yeah. obviously people more broadly considered completely unacceptable and people mm. need to make earlier decisions about how to look after those animals, even if, if there is no rain. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Someone else may want to jump in and add to that. I think I did want to add on, um, you mentioned the subjectivity of animal welfare. And I think the more we press for more objectivity in animal welfare so that it's measurable mm -hmm. and so that we can monitor it over time, um, the more progress we will make. Um, so, you know, using standards that are basically more objective than subjective. Yeah. And then that science really informs mm -hmm. us when we make those ethical decisions as, as a society, when we make decisions around animal use and standards and guidelines, yeah. it really then is reinforced by but robust it does, science. I think speak to the importance of objective research. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying mm -hmm. in terms of making sure we're, I guess, reflecting that animal experience appropriately, that we're not just reflecting what we think is good, mm -hmm. when we're not just doing things that we think would be nice or how the animal would like to be treated, but we're actually asking those questions of the animal and looking to it to, mm -hmm. to guide how we care for it. I think I think goes some of the... Um, sort of that desire to separate those two concepts um, does come from a, a bit of confusion um, and people conflating animal ethics and thinking that that's the same thing as saying animal rights. Um, and I think that that is uh, just a, a language and a knowledge confusion. But realistically, the reason we care about animal welfare, it, it, is, a, it is a question of, of our of moral philosophy, really, and ethics has brought us to the point of caring about their subjective experiences. That's why we and care. They, so it's, it's they, are, like, they are interwoven concepts. Even within our field of animal welfare science, there's probably a range of different stories behind the scientists that are there and probably different levels of caring to advocate for the animal experience mm -hmm. or improvements 
um, you know, like any field, there's a diversity of people that are here yeah. and they're yeah. going to reflect their own attitudes and beliefs as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Now, the next question I think is probably going to come to you first, Mia, uh, again, because it says, how can we better educate the public about the needs of companion animals and should we look to introducing this learning into schools? Oh, great question. Um, there are already some great programs looking to target, I guess, um, kids in schools because that's a great way to affect community change in the, in the longer term if we can influence the attitudes and beliefs of kids and help them understand more about, um, you know, what is good animal welfare and what are ethical choices to make in the way you interact with animals, um, then hopefully we'll have a kinder society, you know, as they mature into adults. Um, I think how else can we engage? I think we have more work to do in understanding that. So there's this, uh, I guess, area of science called human behaviour change. And that's something that we're seeing more of within animal welfare science because it's an interdisciplinary field. It's not just vets. Um, we also have human psychology specialists. We have people who understand the animal experience. We have people who look at the interconnectivity, I guess, of like one welfare where we're talking about human well-being, animal well-being, the environmental well-being. Um, so I guess, yes, I see the being values in those programs. I think from our perspective, we can probably do more as communicators to share our results outside of the typical scientific conferences, scientific publications, um, and help people find out what we're doing. And maybe that's doing outreach to schools and, and talking to kids about what we do and helping them see that scientists don't all wear lab coats and, you know, have an arm up a cow, um, that they can look and be a whole lot of different ways. Um, but I think, yeah, so I think it comes down to how we communicate about the work that we do. And I think it also comes down to understanding how we can influence change uh, in those areas. So say the flat-faced dog crisis, for example, we understand that issue from the dog's perspective very well. We know from talking to people who are asthmatic that that air hunger they experience is one of the worst experiences they can have. Um, so what we need to do now is understand why are people still choosing to have flat-faced dogs. And we've done research to look at, yes, they think they're cute. Yes, they think their dog's not affected. But how else can we influence them to understand you should make a different choice when you're selecting a dog so that your dog can live a happy life and a comfortable life and a long, healthy life? Thank you. And I think educating children is very powerful. I always remember when our children have hopped in the car from even kindergarten a while back and said, Dad, your car is bad for the environment. And so if we can do the same thing with, you know, good animal choices, um, you know, that might be very helpful. I guess the next question is, um, what about the potential of cultivated meat? So meat that doesn't come from animals or cultivated eggs and milk and other alternative proteins to replace intensive animal agriculture. Lauren, this might come to you, I think, in the first instance. So what, what, what's going to happen in terms of these um, animal protein alternatives to perhaps replace some of these animal industries and, and thereby wipe out what some people have concerns around the animal welfare situation? Yeah, look, it's an interesting, it's a tough question, a challenging <laughs> one. I think we're seeing more options come. So for consumers to make choices around um, what they want to, to consume. And so sometimes those, um, what we might call um, more ethical type choices or um, more welfare friendly type choices. So I think it's certainly something that will um, maybe increase in its, in its use, but whether it takes over in a wide, to the wider um, group, I'm not sure. It'd be great though. I, mean, I it think be, it it's like anything, right? Mm. When you've got wider choices and the market decides. So it comes back again to what does the community mm, yeah, want? Exactly. Do they want to make choices away from, you know, relying on animals mm. for their meat and their milk and other produce um, and choose plant-based options or synthetic-based options? Yeah. Um, and we know that there are trade-offs because sometimes they can be a bit more expensive and not everyone has the capacity to be able to make that choice. Um, but I think over time... Um, certainly, I know there's a research team at Melbourne University that are working in that space um, and those costs will come down. So, you know, like, like things, I mm. guess, as a progression over time and mm. as it becomes more affordable and a greater diversity of choices, then, you know, we'll see people make those decisions. Yeah. Okay. And perhaps the, the scale that it may enable then will enable perhaps 
some of the animal industries to work at a, a different scale, which will make it easier to address some of the concerns around intensification, yeah. perhaps. So, yeah. The next question is, um, how do we see the recognition of animals as sentient beings? How will that impact upon policy mm -hmm. and outcomes for, you know, both farmed animals and animals used in sport? And I'm probably going to go to Peter first in, in this case. So how will, how will this recognition of sentience uh, start to uh, affect, um, you know, how animals are treated in, in animals used in sport and entertainment? I think there'll just really be um, a push for increasing research into understanding um, how sentient, uh, how uh, racehorses, for example, um, or greyhounds or, or any animal used for sport or entertainment, um, how that really, um, I Can guess, they perceive their, their life? Or? Yes, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, a lot of the research that we're doing now is is trying to improve their welfare and it's generally more centred around um, their health. Yeah. It's generally more centred around injury prevention. Um, but we are seeing an increase into the space of uh, monitoring their stress levels, for example. Um, uh, and I think the next step beyond that is not just ensuring that you know, they're not highly stressed or they're not prone to injury is, are they happy about that? And I think that's one step that we haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, we're still working in this space of, you know, ensuring that, um, that we keep injury rates down low, um, ensuring that they're not too stressed. A happier horse is a better performing horse. Um, and I think that, that recognizing them as sentient will then, you know, go on to us maybe, uh, putting uh, more of our efforts into researching um, the positive affective state or mental state of those animals um, rather than just focusing on reducing the negative yeah. effects. Okay, this might actually be the last question, but we'll see how we go. This one I think is for you, Lauren. Um, you mentioned that societal expectations influence legislation and standards uh, of farm animal welfare. Um, how does this intersect with animal welfare science? Oh, how does that? So I guess it's societal expectations really drive the way in which we, um, we manage and we interact and the standards and guidelines that come about. So we, needing to, we need animal welfare science to understand the impact then on the way in which we do use, the way in which we manage, the way in which we interact with animals. So Poultry is a great example. It is, and we've actually we've probably seen um, uh, society pressure, see a move um, towards a different type of system before the science actually enabled us to best manage that type of system. So we're talking about eggs and we laying are, hands yes. here, are we? Yep, free range um, and our more loose type systems rather than our caged type system. And I mean, uh, is it the case that? You know, the animal welfare standards that are intended to be regulated for farm animals, are they, are they informed by science? Are they supported by science? Or, uh, they are and they, it... they need to be. Yeah. So I guess science provides us with information. So best place to make decisions around the way in which we um, place our standards and guidelines and our legislation. And it's sort of in line with that sentience. So once we recognise sentience, we recognise animal welfare mm -hmm. and the need for those positive experiences. And that really drives yeah. our standards and our, our guidelines. And we need that evidence base because without that, we risk just doing what we think is best yeah. or yeah. what is most convenient or what is cheapest or what is, yeah. you know, rather than actually doing what yeah. we should. So yeah. it does come back to the ethics and it does come back to community attitudes, but there's definitely a role for that Evidence yeah. as well. And the, I guess the free range poultry is a nice example of that. Like we were moving and um, I guess the, the reason behind it was providing greater behavioural opportunity and, and opportunities mm -hmm. that we expect are going to result in positive experiences. But we then miss also the, the flip side, which is some of those, those negatives that we're perhaps it's, Exposing animals too. It's a case of watch this space and you know, more challenges for the future. Look, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Mia and Peter and Lauren and Alison. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope you found the discussion informative. 
And uh, please join us again soon for more events from the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew.